All right. Um, we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 28. There goes my hero. Thank you. Know whose handwriting this is, but I'll I'll track them down. Uh, I wrote it perfect, and it's only went over. Okay, well I'm gonna pray for us, and there will be in uh, Matthew 28, and going through some stuff. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your love and your mercy. Lord, we need your grace now, uh, even as we have when we were first saved, Lord. Even yesterday. Uh, Lord, and tomorrow we always will need your grace. So we pray, Lord, that you would be kind to us, to send your spirit to work in our minds, to work in our hearts. Give us an uh, engaging mind. Give us uh, thoughts, Lord. Pierce our hearts, God, with your, with your word. Help us, Lord, to be disciples who make disciples. We pray all these things, Father, for the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. We, uh, Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. Um, it's a good text. It's church preached Sunday. I'm going to read through it and uh, go through some things through it. Uh, starting in verse 16, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Um, some points I'm going to draw out of here. Point number one: You are a disciple first, and that's really the heart behind this entire thing. As you see in verse 16, who is gathered on the mountain? The disciples, right? Verse 16, the 11 disciples were on the mountain. And what did he tell his disciples? Go and make disciples. And so that's kind of really the heart behind this is that these are going to be helpful tools for you to practically use, right? Take them, take what you want. And then hopefully they're going to be able to uh, easily transferable to your kids. You can teach them some helpful tips on how to study God's Word and prayer and different things like that, as you yourself can model them uh, to them, right? Because these disciples are commanded by Jesus to go in and make disciples. Um, and how do we make a disciple? Jesus gives us two things to make a disciple. One, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? So he's saying, go... Share the gospel, right? Even uh, Juan mentioned this other Sunday, right? He's not saying go save people. Because why? We can't. That is a work of God. Our job is to preach the gospel, and then we can baptize those who have been saved by God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the second part, right, uh, is teaching to observe all that Christ has commanded. I mean, I think that part gets overlooked a lot, right? He said everything that Jesus has commanded. That is what making a disciple is. That's a lot. Jesus commands a lot. And I think I, you could argue, what is it that Jesus has commanded? This is all his work. The whole Bible is what he has commanded of us, right? He asked us throughout, from Genesis to Revelation... He has given us um, his law and instructions um, and things that we should be uh, observing, right? ESV says, right? What is observing? Looking at, seeing, and as well as keeping, right? So it's intellectual, right? Learning things. Also obeying and keeping his commands. All right, so in my attempt, right, um, I'm trying to be helpful. I'm going to summarize all that Christ has commanded into five categories. And hopefully you can be like, you missed one. That's okay. You can tell me later which one I missed, and that will help me reshape this. But I'm going to try to summarize all five, oh, five things that 
to summarize all that Christ has commanded. One, meditate on God's word. Two, pray. Three, fighting sin and sins. Plural, sin and sins. Four, uh, four evangelism, evangelize. And then five, I call it life. Home and church is really the, right. It's the how you interact in these certain spheres. Um, instead of going through, you know, in detail all the spheres of content, I'm trying to going to be more practical with this uh, right here. So I'm going to try to give you practical tips on how to do these things. So uh, let's go ahead and just start. So first, uh, meditating on God's word. So once again, this is for you. And hopefully, you can do this and communicate it well and help your uh, kid also do these things. So, meditating God's Word. Um, right? Reading is not the goal. Right? There's no verses. Read your Bible. Uh, and it's interesting, right? The printing press didn't get invented until the 1500s. So, I think right now, if Christ were to come back and we would see, right, God's people are gathered, majority would, of Christians would probably be illiterate. So how do we take the command of God's word to meditate on it if most of Christendom at this point is probably illiterate? Right? The goal is to help them meditate. So you want to take that idea, pretend right, they cannot read. Take those principles and apply it to your kids who can read or you're teaching to read. Right? These are the things that we're trying to uh, help them with. So one, to meditate. Meditate in observation. Meditate in interpretation. And meditate in application. So meditate in how they observe the text. Meditate in how they interpret the text. And meditation in how they apply the text. I'm going to be primarily focusing on observation. Right? Observation is asking the question, what do I see? You're collecting data from God's Word. So even before you say, this is what the Scripture says, this is, what it, this is what it means, and before you say, this is how I interact with it and apply it, how do you just simply study God's Word? Because that's the majority of our time in God's Word, is the opposite of observing, right? And it's after a lot of collecting data, then, then we can show them, this is how I actually get the meaning out of it. This is how I know accurately and confidently this is what the Word of God means. If we go straight to meaning, we may be missing things. We also, we don't want to give a false impression of what a quiet time is. Right? You come here on Sunday and you hear a sermon preached. And you're like, wow, God's Word is good. I'm going to go home. And you're like, I'm not getting anything close to what I heard on Sunday. Right? Why? There were hours and hours and hours of preparation that went into the sermon. Right? That's what we don't see. And so sometimes there's a miscommunication of like, having my quiet time right now, I feel so good. Like, you see all these, this information coming, right? It's just a labor. We're laboring. We are digging up and we're trying to find gems. Right? And often, like, we're building a house, another illustration I usually tell you, right? What's the most important part of the house? The foundation. Takes the longest, and how many right? The market is crazy right now. Right? How many go like, man, that's a great foundation. I want to buy that house. That's usually now what happens, right? And that's our temptation with God's word is like we want to get straight to the color of the walls, the windows, right? We want to, no, like we need to observe and, and set some time, set time in it. So here's some tools for observation. One, read a whole book at a time, right? This is a good thing that we model here at Park. We are working through books of the Bible. Right? Sit down and just read a whole entire book. If you can, right? Smaller books are going to be easier for that. You might not be able to sit down and read all of Genesis in one go. Right? Before we go deep and start digging, see that this is one book. There is one author with one message. Genesis is just one story. You know what I'm saying. Like, Ephesians is one letter, right? And so before we go into chapter 2, and you were dead, right? We want to see that there's actually a bigger scope going on. Read whole books. And teach your kids to read whole books. Read repeatedly. 
read over and over and over again. Say you're in Ephesians, sit down in the morning, and just read chapter 1 for 15 minutes. Just keep reading it. Because honestly, what you're going to do is, I'm going to probably test us right now, right? We can read it for 15 minutes, and then I'm going to ask you a question without looking at the text, and you're not going to be able to call all the information. Right? It takes time. Uh, repeating things is a great tool to help us soak in God's Word. Uh, write it out. Manually write out the Word of God. This helps, it helps you and it'll help your kids. How many times you sat down with God's Word and you already find yourself impatient? Right? I gotta get this done. I got 15 minutes. We've already messed up. We've already messed up our time with God's Word. And really what writing up, it forces us to slow down. And to say, I'm not having any goals to accomplish here. Writing out forces our heart to check it and say, why am I having a quiet time now? I'm here to spend time with God. And writing out forces you to go to such a screeching halt slowly and almost painfully after a while with your hand. You're like, I'm not trying to climb some ladder in Christendom. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to spend time with my Lord. I'm trying to really soak in every word. And that's really a good way to teach people, hey, let's write out God's word together. Let's write out chapter 1 of Ephesians. And you'll see how painful that can be. Um, another thing right now goes to memorization. So memorize God's word. Usually what I do is I take a section of like a paragraph maybe, of scripture and I'll write it out and I'll go through the first verse and I'll say it out loud ten times. Uh, this is good. Uh, Pastor Dave taught me this. Uh, the, the, uh, Andy Davis extended approach to extend the memory. Purchase in memory, right? It's a great little, they have them for free. Uh, basically how actors uh, remember lines and plays and things like that. So it's very helpful, right? I write it out first, and then I do the approach of say it one time, say it two times, say it three times, and around five or six, I start trying, your brain switches, start trying to do it without looking at the text. And your brain is now forcing yourself to try to not just read it, but now you're trying to recall it. It's a good exercise to do with your kids. Hey, let's Write the scripture out, and let's try to memorize it together. Let's say it out loud, right? And you can say it out loud, and you're going to get your kids are watching you be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're teaching them uh, as well. Listen to scripture. Another tool for us, uh, right? We have taken the diamond of God's word, and we're looking at it with these different tools from different angles. Listen to the scripture. Let your kids watch you listen to scripture. Why do your parents read the Bible? I think so. I know they listen to it, right? <laughs> I can hear out loud them kind of meditating as you wash dishes. Play scripture, right? Um, ask questions, right? Spend your time, right? This is your quiet time. Just look, look to the text and write out questions, right? You're studying Ephesians chapter 1 today. I'm going to find 10 questions in chapter 1, right? It's going to help with meditation. That's the goal is to meditate on God's word. Right? And that word meditate is where we get mutter, mutter, you're muttering under your breath. It's, you're contemplating, you're trying, asking questions is a good way to do that, and a good way to get you and your kids to engage in the text. Force them, give me ten questions from this chapter, right? And you'll be surprised at some of the questions that they can give you. Um, seven, uh, pray through the scripture. Right? You've been studying Ephesians. You're in chapter 1, you've done these things, pray through the text. Pray out loud. Turn it into prayers. Um, and then our last tool is outline. Outlining scripture. All right, so here is a little illustration that someone drew uh, for how to outline scripture. I'm going to get on this side. And really the goal of outlining, uh, outlining is not for everyone. As I disciple people, I see some are like, they catch it and they're like, they love it and they're great with it. Some I have to teach outlining over and over and over again because it's just it's hard to grasp, right? What you're trying to do with outlining is you're trying to um, compartmentalize almost like the ideas and thoughts and how they are building blocks on top of one another. So I'll show you, right? Uh, Matthew 28. All right. Um, and as you, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to go from the largest scripture to the smallest verse without skipping steps. 
right? So largest section of scripture to smallest section of scripture without skipping steps, right? And, and what you're trying to do is you're going to have two things that you're going to be engaging with each one. It's what is happening in the text and what is the theological point in the text. So what is happening in Matthew 28? Does anyone have an answer? Of the whole book. Not Matthew 28, sorry, not uh, one, chapter 1 of Matthew through 28. Sorry, that says Matthew 28. That's whoever wrote that. Uh, that was a mistake on them. Uh, Matthew 1 through 28. What is happening? Jesus is the Messiah, right? It's, it's the, uh, the gospel of Jesus, right? It's, it's a story. Life, death, resurrection. What is the theological point of Jesus? And that's really, right, it's the gospel of Jesus is what's happening. Matthew is proving that Jesus is the Christ. Right? There's a theological point that Matthew's going to be making. He's trying to, he has an audience in mind, and he's trying to persuade them Jesus is the Christ that we were waiting for. And we missed it. So as we go through this, if that piece, if that's 1 through 28, as you get down, all of these should also be pointing to that point. So you have Matthew 1 through 4. What is happening in Matthew 1 through 4? Does anyone know? Genealogy, or pre-ministry Jesus. Right? So it's kind of like early ministry Jesus. Right? Right? There's a theological point also. And this is what we're trying to do to help, right? You may not know the theological point of what you're doing. But what can help you find that out is by going deeper in. Because the smaller points will point to the bigger point. Does that make sense? So they're all in order. These points make up the points. So you have sentences that make up paragraphs, and paragraphs make up chapters, and chapters make up books. And they're all pointing to an idea. And that's really what you're trying to demonstrate. This is easy for some people. This is very hard for people. But I tell you what it is. It's very challenging. It forces you to sit and to think. What is, and really all this is for Matthew 3. So we get, so, so I kind of skip down. Matthew 3. Uh, um, yeah, Matthew 3 and 4. Then Matthew 3, verses 1 through 17. So go, turn to Matthew chapter 3. What time do I get out of here? I have that on there. Now? Yeah. Um, so you have Matthew 3, 1 through 17. What is happening is John the Baptist interacting with Jesus. John, who John the Baptist is, is interacting with Jesus. That's literally all chapter 3. But there's a point that Matthew is trying to make. And remember, that point is going to point to the bigger idea. He's trying to persuade Jesus is the Christ. Right? And so as you go further in, right, we now what's the next biggest section? What's well, Matthew 3, 1 through 6? And so you see 1 through 6, right? And as you go to 1 through 6 and um, 7 through, oh, I don't have it down there. That's not there. Like 1 through 6, 7 through 10. Um, or 7 through 12, 13 through 17, these are all sections and they're building on top of one another to point to an overarching idea of chapter 3, which is pointing to an overarching idea of that section, which is part of the grand scheme of Matthew 20. And what you're trying to help uh, your, yourself and your kids see is that the scripture is connected. And that there are points that the author is making and we can dig deep, even to the smallest, smallest, tiniest part of the scripture and see it is not there by accident. It is telling us something, which is telling us something, which is telling us something, which is the overarching point. Jesus is the Christ. And so I'm going to go ahead and spoil this. We're not going to break it through, right? 1 through 6 is telling us who John the Baptist is and what his ministry is. Right? That's what's happening. What is the theological point? By how he is telling us who he is and what his ministry is, Matthew is making the illusion that John the Baptist is Elijah. Right? 
that is the point that, that 1 through 6 in chapter 3 is making. Right? The scripture that is being here of the, a prophet is coming. The description of chapter 4, garment of camel's hair, a leather belt around his waist, and food with locusts and wild honey. Matthew, to his audience, is trying to convince them that Jesus is the Christ by showing you John the Baptist. John the Baptist is coming. He is the Elijah the prophet who is to forerun for the Lord. Who comes after John the Baptist? Well, Jesus. Matthew is making the point. If he is Elijah and Jesus is the person who stands with the tie, he must be the Lord. He's making this argument to his Jewish audience by the outline. As you go down to the very point, right, as you go smaller and smaller down, it really helps. And if you need help, if you want to learn this more, you can come see me. I really enjoy outlining. I think it's very helpful. It's uh, it, it's frustrating. It makes you slow down. But honestly, I mean, if you're like me, sometimes I need a break from just reading. I really want to engage in the text, go deep, find what the author is trying to say. And, and really what helps you is do I know this text for sure, what it means? And do I know, because once you get down to it, right, Matthew 3 is very helpful for what, right? When Jesus comes, he's going to get baptized. Why is Jesus being baptized? Once you find out why, why John the Baptist is baptizing these Jewish people, it says for repentance of sins. So why is Jesus coming to be baptized? And this helps you think and thought provoking as you outline. Uh, outline's great, guys. It's really, it's really good. Hopefully, I did a good job of selling it. If not, I made you stay away from it for the rest of your life. One or the other. That's usually how it goes. Um, but with all these tools, right, here's some reminders for yourself and your kid. Because I can give you these things, things you should be doing, things you can be doing in your quiet times. But reminder, in your time in, your, in God's Word, that does not make you more loved by God. It is a trap we lay out for ourselves all the time. Your quiet times, your time in God's Word, your, how you are doing your quiet time with your kids, or showing them does not make God love you more. Your lack of time in God's Word does not make God love you less. You are free to study God's Word. And that's a reminder we should, as we have these tools and we get practical, do this, do this, do this, we need to remind ourselves, I get to do this. And if we stop that, we've already made a mistake because that's not what it was for. The law is for us to delight in. So, you're going to have times, and you're going to have to model this to your kids. I don't want to spend time in God's Word, but I'm going to make myself do it. Why? Why are you making yourself study God's Word? Why are you outlining when you don't want to? Not because you, need, you want God to love you. Not because you want God to accept you. He does love you. He does accept you. And I am free to study God's Word even when I don't feel like it. But I know it's good for me and it's going to honor uh, God. Um, so, uh, with time in God's Word, do not teach your kids legalism and moralism. It's, it's hard. We have to check ourselves. Don't teach them legalism and moralism. Teach them self-discipline and self-control. And there's a difference there. We, need to, we, need to, we want them to know this does not make God love them. Jesus Christ is why God loves me. His death and the resurrection is the only reason He will love me. So when I fail at reading my Bible, there's not a secret, right? Maybe I'm justified, maybe I'm not. Or even when I am spending time in God's Word, oh, there's no way God is, you know, would possibly not justify me in my sins. We want to be careful of those traps. Secondly, uh, I'm going to speedily go through the rest of these because we're out of time. Meditate on God's word. Secondly, prayer. Pray through scripture. We already talked about that. We also have uh, the acronym ACTS. A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. We want to model that for our kids. And I recommend, right, not doing them all at the same time. Monday, focus on adoration. Tuesday, Focus on confession. 
Wednesday, focus on Thanksgiving. Thursday, focus on supplication, right? And well, so su with supplication, right, you have uh, different circles. So su supplication, you're not praying for things. You're uh, asking God for things. Really, the idea is begging. Start with yourself. I need God, I need prayer more than anyone else. Then my family. Then my church. My, my church. Then my friends and my neighbors. And then the world. Right? And this is the circle. And even with each of the circles, right, you're helping them to track their prayers and you for track your prayers. If you get lost in prayer, this is a helpful tool. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. I'm asking for things. Let me pray for myself first. And I'll pray for my family. And I'll pray for my church. And I'll pray for right and that way you can keep track of where you're at. And each of those things, what should I pray for? Right? How many times have you gotten to prayer? Like, I know I should pray for something. What should I pray for? Heart, mind, body. Those two things are very helpful for me, right? I want to pray for my own heart, my, my affections, my desires, I'm for my mind, my thoughts, my attention, my focus. I want to pray for my body. Physical healing, uh, energy, strength, right? Uh, keep going. Prayer walking. Another helpful tool for your, you and your kids. Take them with you in quick 10-second prayers. Right? What does Matthew 6 tell you? Do not keep up empty phrases. He already knows you're going to pray for you. Model that to your kids. Quick 5, 10-second prayers. That's all we're going to do. Back and forth. Doesn't be fancy. Doesn't be crazy. Let's just pray where it comes to our mind or hearts. And you walk around just praying. But there's also individual prayer that, you, that I recommend you do and, and teach your kids. Fill your guts to God. Yeah. Right? No circles, no like do this, this. Just as you walk, what are the first things that come to your mind and come to your heart? They're probably things that you've been burying deep down. And when you have time alone, what are the first things that want to bust their way up to the surface? That stressed me out. That bothered me. I'm worried about that. Think, 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 think. And then... Give it to the Lord. And this is what I do individually, just praying. Um, schedule your prayers. Schedule your time in God's Word. Right? Um, uh, David Matthews, Habits of Grace, he says in your time of Word, you should have, he recommends having a time of devotion and a time of study. Right? But we, planning it doesn't make it less spiritual. If you're having a tar, hard time with quiet times, if your kids are having a hard time with quiet times, just map out the week. When am I going to do it? And when am I going to do it? And put what you're going to do put small. Don't shoot big. You want to encourage, right? Hit the goals. Not, ah, we keep failing, right? Uh, show them that it, it can be done. Um, thirdly, fighting sins. We are sinners. Let your, show your kids that you're sinners and you need forgiveness. Ask them for forgiveness. When you mess up, when you make a mistake, ask them for forgiveness. Show them that growth is slow. And there are two things I think we want to show them in repentance. There is the spiritual side and there is the physical side. Spiritual. Help them see, right, in yourself. I need to be falling in love with the Lord and hating sin. That's the key to repentance. Loving God, hating sin. And asking forgiveness is just an outpouring of that. But there's also the physical side. Memorizing scripture, fasting, Setting up uh, blockades and boundaries to sin. Having accountability. Right? Have accountability with them. Let your kids see, hey, I meet with this person to talk about my sin and talk about our life. I need help. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. And not only need Jesus, I need this church. Without it, I'm going to be less awful. Let your kids see these things. Um, and then, let's see, evangelism. Make sure your kids know what the gospel is. Often the thing Pastor Dave does me, right? Give me the gospel in 60 seconds or less. Often if you've done a membership interview, you've probably been asked that question. Have your kids, hey, what's the gospel? Six seconds, fun game. You know, what, what is salvation? What is and what isn't evangelism? Uh, I have a scale of evangelism that I've been teaching uh, middle school and high schoolers at night. I think it's very helpful. If you want to know more about that, I can go more details later. Right? Often evangelism is sharing the gospel, but there's usually steps that take to sharing the gospel. You have a stranger, 
an acquaintance, acquaintance to lowercase g God, right? Spiritual, religious, to g the gospel. And all that we're trying to do is we're trying to help people get there to where we can have share the gospel with them. And it doesn't happen. So let your kids see this. The waitress, the waiter at the restaurant, ask them their name and pray for them when you pray for the meal. Right? Easy tip for your kids to see. I'm engaging with the people around me. I want them to know Jesus. Let's pray for them and pray that they would uh, help their faith. Help them come into saving faith and encourage them. And whatever prayer request they give you, pray for that as well. Um, uh, meet, ways to meet strangers. Let your kids see. Talk to your neighbors. Engage your neighbors. Let your kids bake things with you and hand things out to your neighbors. Let them, that's an easy way for you to engage and let your kids see that. Um, restaurants, prayer, uh, co-workers. Invite co-workers ever for dinner. Um, and lastly, uh, use your church. I'm not going to go into that. You guys don't know church. You're good. But often evangelism is not individualistic in the scriptures. It's usually a group effort. Read Romans 16 this afternoon. Paul is a lot of people who did ministry. Where did he get this list of tons of names? Um, so, uh, lastly, life. This is where we'll close. Uh, your kids are watching. Home and church life are things that you can teach. But as Bobby said, a lot of things are called, not taught. What is your role in the home? What is your role in the church? And they're watching. They're not just watching what you're doing. They're watching how you feel about what you're doing. Are you excited to come to church? Are you excited when you leave church? Are you excited when you pray for someone, you read God's word? Is there a delight? And this is what we want to be showing them, is our joy for these things. He has set us free. Not uh, the labor of love, but more labor than it is love, right? No, it's good. I love this. It's free. God's commands are not burdensome. And then ask questions, right? Because ultimately your role in the church and your home Ask your kids. Engage with them. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? How can they serve? What are they doing? What do they want to do? Where might they see themselves serving in five years, ten years? Right? We want to engage them in these uh, conversations. So, um, final reminders, because we are way out of time. We are saved by grace. We are saved by God's grace. Quiet times that make you more loved by God. Your discipleship does not make you more accepted in God's eyes. You are loved through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. These things will not determine your justification. Right? But you're helping your kids with you in, in your sanctification. Thirdly, it's worth it. Sometimes we don't see the little that we do. Anything little over a long span of time, God will use. Right? We can see how little things over time, right? Ask Dave about leaks in his house, okay? He's given a story multiple times, right? A little drip is nothing. A little drip over long periods of time does work. And same with the good. Day in, day out, delighting in going to church, delighting in prayer, you're discipling your kids. Fourth, the Lord's commands are not burdensome. Show them delight, show them joy in discipleship and in your own walk with the Lord. If you have any questions, um, we're about to have a Q&A or you can come see me later. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful uh, for people in Scripture uh, like Peter, who was a disciple of yours and failed often. We are thankful, Lord, that uh, our discipleship does not determine our salvation but Lord, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and we are free by your Son to make disciples. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to make disciples in our own home, knowing first that we are sheep first, and we are in need of our great shepherd. Help us, Lord, to teach our children how to be good sheep, going to our shepherd daily. We pray all these things in Christ.